All right, sounds good. Well, thank you, thank you folks for joining us uh, today. This is session two in this series. My name is June Klein-Bacon and uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am a project manager with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. I've got about 20 years of experience in the field of human services, disability services, uh, and over eight years of that with the Brain Injury Alliance. I want to, of course, thank uh, the, the different organiz organizers that came together to put this, uh, put this on for you, and definitely thank Diane for uh, allowing me to join her today. Um, I would just, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and would ask that you mute yourselves. Um, and if you called in uh, and need to unmute to ask questions, feel free to let us know or to share comments uh, as needed. And you should have heard that the session is being recorded. Uh, the sessions that are recorded will be uploaded on both the coalition and BIA's uh, YouTube channels, as well as being sent out with presentation materials. Um, and I know that we're going to be checking on last week's session to make sure that you guys all get that. I would note for calendar purposes that the next session is going to be on February 3rd at 3.30. So scheduled for February 3rd, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. And if you want to get that in your calendars, so just and again, I would just just so encourage you I'm to sure. mute. <laughs> um, I think Miss is okay. also going to yes. try to help us. And let's say, like, let's make sure that folks are muted. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so I do just want to thank you for, again, thank you all for joining us today to speak about, um, Diane's got some content that she's going to share, but I'm also going to speak just briefly on considering adult brain injury screening implementation for your practice or your organization. Uh, I will note that we are going to be highlighting the adult brain injury screening tool that's been endorsed by the Department of Public Health here in Iowa, as well as the Governor Advisory uh, Council on Brain Injuries. We have a modified tool out of Ohio State University, and uh, we, I, I say we in the collective here in Iowa worked with the author, Dr. John Corrigan, uh, to modify it for Iowa's needs. And I would also note, depending on your setting, your practice, or your organization, there is also a pediatric screening tool if that's something that you need to consider, um, I, I definitely can get some information out to you on that as well. The screening tool that I'll be talking about today has been normed for individuals 13, of age, 13 years of age and older. Um, I am going to go into just some, some brief stats. Um, I think that it just kind of sets up, again, the reason why we might consider brain injury screening. Um, and so we just have a brief introduction here on some statistics, um, but also would note that Diane has definitely shared some of this information already. Um, if you were a part of last, last week's or a couple weeks ago, uh, the great presentation that was, that was held then. And I also know that she'll be going into some of these uh, stats and, and scenarios more in depth than her coming presentations. So if we could just take a moment to remind ourselves of the numbers of individuals that experience brain injury here in Iowa, approximately 3,100 Iowans are hospitalized annually just for traumatic brain injury. Uh, and we know that nearly 24,000 are treated and released from the ER on an annual basis. Uh, here in Iowa, uh, to put some, some things into perspective in, in terms of who's accessing services or who might not be accessing services, as, as of 2021, uh, there is a cap of about, uh, the exact number actually is 1,580 people uh, that are able to access the Medicaid home and community-based brain injury waiver program. Um, and we have approximately 100,000 Iowans living with long-term disability as a result of an acquired brain injury. So when you're thinking about who is it that has a brain injury, who are we serving that might have a brain injury, if, if, if as I go through and kind of talk about some of these numbers and why you might consider screening for brain injury, um, I, think, I think it's pretty important to, to understand that there's lots of people that are, that are trying to figure out how to work, how to live, how to play in their communities with brain injury. 
Um, when we think about undiagnosed or untreated brain injury, this absolutely can result in individuals being labeled as non-compliant, um, can certainly exasperate health or even social inequities, while making it more difficult to engage in services. Uh, challenges that we might see include things like attending to tasks or responsibilities, uh, following procedures, navigating instructions, uh, let alone complex instructions. And I know, I know Diane touched on some of this last week. So kind of understanding those functions can be really helpful um, when we are thinking about, uh, and I apologize, I'm looking away from my screen because I'm just checking to mute a few more folks. Um, again, if you're joining us, if you could mute, that would be really helpful. So as we think about, again, kind of physical, cognitive, or neurobehavioral challenges that a person with brain injury might experience, I would encourage you through these sessions that, that you're, you have the opportunity to engage in to start thinking about what skills do you require of the clients that you're serving, of the people that you are serving. Uh, what skill must they possess to be successful with a, with a given treatment plan or service plan? Um, and what accommodations might you, might you apply without hesitation, say for a physical disability that uh, might be more easily understood? Um, if we think about service planning with brain injury in mind, um, we can start to layer in kind of an understanding of functional changes and challenges uh, that might be there. And, and we do have a variety of, of materials on our website that we can, we can certainly share with you or link um, our resources page into the chat. Um, I'll probably do that when I'm done speaking here. So as we start to understand, and again, uh, these are just some, some high level notations about some stats um, that I'd like to, to hopefully grab your attention in terms of thinking about implementing screening for brain injury. Um, Identifying brain injury as a possible layer of a person's experience and engagement with, ser with different service lines can really add another layer, layer to person-centered experiences and person-centered service planning. Uh, we know that um, among other physical and cognitive impacts that brain injury can have, um, brain injury can uh, create a risk for problem behaviors. Um, and we know uh, that while, while we can look to the data that Diane has shared and that I shared in terms of hospitalizations for brain injury, we know that about 42% of people who indicate that they've had a traumatic brain injury as defined by the CDC don't even seek medical attention. Okay, so, so I would encourage you to kind of think about that. Um, we have a list here of different life experiences and even different systems uh, that people may engage with um, that have higher rates of brain injury than just what we see in the general population. Um, we know that there's higher prevalence rates um, in, the, in the 30 to 50% of people that um, have mental health conditions also have sustained a brain injury. Um, we know one of the really surprising stats or one of, one of the really surprising stats I should, I should emphasize is that for 72% of individuals that are in, um, engaged in dual treatment for substance use disorders and uh, severe mental illness have had a history of at least one traumatic brain injury. 72%. I just, that, that number kind of blows me out of the water. Um, when we look at criminal justice involvement, we're talking um, upwards of 80% of adults um, and about 40, I think the number is about 44% of, of those involved with juvenile justice uh, have had a history of brain injury. Um, and so, again, as, as you hear some of those just brief stats, um, I'm working just to reinforce the importance and understanding of how the, the layer of understanding brain injury or screening for brain injury in the work that you're, the very important work that you're already doing um, can, can really uncover some additional la layers about the people that we're collectively serving. Um, and so I, I would, we, we frequently um, want to make sure that as we get into what the screening looks like, this is not a diagnostic test. Um, it is a screening for brain injury. It does not indicate an 
absence for brain injury or a diagnosis for brain injury, but is really meant to assess for a person's exposure to brain injury. So um, as, as we seek to, to really infuse brain injury screening as a part of everyday practice, there are really three questions that organizations or you as a professional may wanna consider. So first, when do you, when do you implement screening? Uh, the screening tool itself can bring about a variety of motion, emotions and responses. Uh, therefore, it is important for screeners to prepare the client for the possibility that you know, there, there may be a need to pause. Uh, there may need to be a need to consider identifying coping mechanisms prior to screening, uh, as well as provide opportunity for connection and coping or, or potentially even grounding post-screening when necessary. Um, and I will share uh, probably the two, two areas um, that, that significant emotion may, may be brought up is when we're talking about intimate partner violence, um, as well as um, overdose situations with, with substance use disorder. Um, but we know from the work that we do at the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa that just talking about brain injury can be emotional for some folks, um, whether that be family members or the individual themselves that has sustained brain injury. So providers and, and you as professionals may consider implementing screening tools prior to the start of services, um, part of that intake process. Um, you may want to consider, you know, whether there's a relationship you want to build with a client before consider, considering screening, um, or if you do that when a significant change is observed. While we, again, we know that screenings are not diagnostic, uh, we want them to be used as uh, tools uh, for you to consider uh, and, and can point a person and or their team to additional referrals for further assessment, identify symptoms uh, that inform service or treatment planning. Um, and again, this, this is a tool that has been modified uh, using an evidence-based tool out of Ohio State University. I'm not sure if I mentioned that at the forefront. This is a little bit challenging to see. see. Um, however, it, I, it really is, serves as a placeholder for us to just talk about the, the look of the screening tool. I will link uh, in the chat uh, the link where you can get copies of the screening tool. I would note that the adult screening tool is um, including English uh, and Spanish. It is in seven languages total currently uh, on the Department of Public Health website. Uh, this lifetime history of brain injury screening tool is really going to ask four broad questions. Um, it's going to um, address whether or not an injury has caused a loss of consciousness. And remember that loss of consciousness is not um, a requirement um, in terms of brain injury. We have folks that have not lost consciousness that have sustained brain injury. Uh, if an individual has experienced Oh, was there a question? Can you just deliver, or yeah, yeah, mail it, whatever. Yeah, when you don't live in town, that makes it easy. Sorry. Oh, I think that that was not for me. That's okay. Um, if an individual has lost consciousness uh, from a drug overdose or being choked specifically um, is asked about related to that intimate partner violence piece. Uh, if an individual has ever been told by a doctor or other health professionals that they have a number of conditions that fall in that um, acquired brain injury umbrella that Diane, I think, spoke to last week. So getting away from, from just the traumatic brain injury and those, um, those impacts to the head, uh, but also looking at things like stroke, uh, tumors, um, uh, encephal uh, encephalitis, uh, seizure activity, um, those kinds of things, near drownings, um, those kinds of things can also be considered brain injury when we're thinking about oxygen to the brain and other impacts uh, that happen in the brain. So when we look at interpreting results, a screener is really looking to identify the worst injury the most severe injury and the first injury. Uh, we definitely recognize with first injury, there's some developmental stages, particularly uh, if somebody sustains an injury after the age of, oh, I would say uh, 25 or so. Um, there's something to be, to be said about understanding when that first injury happened, particularly if we might consider it a pediatric injury. Um, and then there's uh, some, some, uh, some information that goes into understanding when the worst injury was, 
um, what it was, as well as the most severe injury. Um, and then when we, again, when we move through the interpretation of the results, um, understanding that we're going to be asking about acquired brain injury, uh, which is where really this modified tool does diverge from its original tool, um, where again, we're asking about drug overdoses, choking, um, and those other acquired brain injuries. Um, but again, when we look at this list, people may not label um, these as brain injuries. Uh, the respondent may not understand that stroke is also brain injury, um, that an overdose may have caused a brain injury. Uh, when we're talking about situations where they may have uh, gone with a lack, lack of oxygen to their brain, those are situations that brain injury may be part of their profile. Um, also, I would add to that list, although it's traumatic brain injury in nature, is concussion. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, I miss being in person because I really like to see all the hands go up um, or lack of hands, I should say, when I first ask, has, do you know of anybody that's had a brain injury? And I, or have you ever had a brain injury? And, and oftentimes with the, with the folks that I might be training, um, they might not be kind of in the brain injury niche or disability services niche. And I might get a couple of hands that go up. But then when I ask questions like, do you know anybody that's haven't had an overdose where they've gone without oxygen? Do you know anybody that's ever been choked as a result of, of domestic violence or, or otherwise? Um, have you ever, ever had a concussion or know somebody that's had a concussion? And I start to see kind of all these hands popping up. And so trying to connect the dots to understand that that's brain injury too um, can be really powerful. Um, so in terms of responding to a positive screen, I think that there are a couple of steps to really be taken. Um, it should be met with a plan. Uh, going into a screening, understanding what the plan will be. Should it be positive? Should it be negative? Um, screeners should be prepared to make referrals uh, to physicians or other qualified med medical professionals uh, for the development of a plan for further assessment as appropriate. Um, if there are broader professional teams involved, natural supports involved, uh, that can be made aware of, a, of screening results, this can be helpful and can really contribute to considerations for a variety of reasons, treatment planning, service planning, uh, natural supports. Um, and then clients, uh, family members, caregivers, and professionals uh, can all, um, one in the same kind of contact the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa for resources. And I will just, um, I will take this time to just kind of talk about our services. Um, I'll put uh, contact information again in the, in the chat and then we can, we'll be able to load up Diane's, uh, Diane's part of today's session. Um, our organization, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, we have a core service called Neural Resource Facilitation. Uh, it's an evidence-based service uh, recognized nationally. Uh, the service is available to individuals that experience brain injury, their family members and caregivers, as well as professionals serving them. Uh, the service is free to Iowans or fee-free, fee as our director likes to say. Um, it's, it's a service that's funded through our legislature um, and through contracts that we have with the Department of Public Health. Uh, this program is, is truly designed to support individuals touched by brain injury, learn more about and how to navigate life post-injury, um, how to access information and resources, as well as make informed choices about what next steps might be, uh, regardless of where they're at post-injury. Uh, that could be, you know, their injury was yesterday. Um, we also have people that contact us five, 10 years post-injury um, when, when they come upon our information. Uh, professionals can access informational resources as well as technical assistance through our facilitators um, are, who are trained as certified brain injury specialists. Uh, we have both free and paid memberships that are available. Um, again, I'll post some information in the chat. Uh, one resource that I think could be really incredible for, for you all is our Iowa Brain Injury Resource Network. If you're not already a member, um, I would very much uh, enjoy having conversation with you um, or an email exchange with you to learn about how that program, which is a network of professionals across the state of Iowa that have our information hard copy on hand, as well as um, PDFs and whatnot that you can, that you can email out, um, in addition to access to things like in-services, technical assistance, and direct referral programs 
to our facilitators with the clients that you're serving. So I'm going to just pop my, um, uh, well, I guess this is my direct contact information. I will put that in the chat. This is our organizational contact uh, information. I do just um, for for uh, prosperity sake, do need to make sure that I that I have in here our our funding source again is that brain injury service program. Ooh. Uh, brain Injury Services Program, sorry, that startled me. Uh, brain Injury Services Program through the Department of Public Health. Um, and our information can be found on our website as well. So um, I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I know I noted that I, there was a few things that I was definitely gonna add in the chat uh, as far as resources. But if there's anybody that has immediate questions as far as, um, my piece of the presentation goes, feel free to throw those in the chat um, or come off mute and let me know. Uh, I'm hanging around till 4.30 so I can answer questions at the end as well if that's, uh, if that's the way we wanna go. So I'll turn it over to you for now, Diane, unless somebody has a question. All right. So am I, I'm officially sharing, we can all see me, right? <laughs> or not see me, but see my screen. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <gasps> all right. So I wanted to thank June for telling us all about the uh, what is offered through the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa and uh, and about the screening tool. Super important. Um, and thank uh, IC and APSI and Children and Families of Iowa that employs me and the Brain Injury Alliance for all being part of this. All right. So we're gonna move on. Um, we uh, talked last week or two weeks ago about, we kind of broke the whole brain apart and said, we've got this lobe and that lobe and they all do all these different things. And so now we know, right? When you know better, you, you do better when you know better and now we know better. Um, and we did that because it's important because the explanation guides your intervention. And we talked about that last week as well. If we understand what's going on, we are in a better position to be able to address those needs. Um, but you say, but there's so much cool stuff that you talked and I can't possibly remember it all. Uh, no, you probably can't. Um, and that doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that we're curious, that we do not just assume that someone um, is able that it comes down to just be there being difficult or whatever, but that we kind of like, we try to break things apart, really find out what's going on. Um, and how, what can we do to be more curious? How, what are the resources that we can use to find out the information, assuming that we didn't just have a photographic memory and remember everything that was said two weeks ago. Um, one is your brain injury alliance. Uh, June did a fabulous job. You guys got an idea of how much information that they have. So certainly contacting them. And I'm going to be mentioning a number of different resources that are available through them. In addition to that neural resource facilitation and the iBrain network. The other thing that you can do if you're curious about brains and you're just all things brains and want to learn more is there is a free app called 3D Brain. There is, you can also buy like an upgraded version, but honestly, I find the free version a little bit easier to navigate actually. Um, and 3D Brain, it, it breaks, like you get this thing and you get your app, you know, all your brain knowledge right there in your hand. And then you can look up, it has all the different segments like all the different lobes that we talked about two weeks ago and then it also has like a case study so it'll say if something went wrong with xyz part of the brain what um what would you see what would happen um and you can really get an idea of how that functions super super helpful all your brain all your neuro knowledge right there in the palm of your hand right so this is a list that um, I found at some professional place about um, all the common neurobehavioral changes after brain injury. Um, the brain does what? What? We're not in person. You guys aren't yelling at. The brain does everything. It does all of the things. Um, and so basically everything 
if you hurt your toe, you, you don't actually feel that in your toe. You feel that in your brain. Um, it feels like you feel it in your toe. Actually, your brain is telling you that there's pain. Everything happens in the brain. You move your arm, it happens in your brain. You catch a ball, it happens in your brain. You have an emotional outburst, it happens in your brain, right? So I talked last week about my friend, Becky. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome human being um, who experienced a brainstem cavernoma which means that all the little capillaries in her brain kind of twisted up with each other and it started to bleed out. And Becky being Becky, who is, you know, I think I mentioned most beautiful in her class, also a merit scholar, was my roommate, just massive human being who was amazing. Um, so when Becky experienced a brain injury, she created her own deficits list. Um, and sent this to all of her friends and family so that they would understand what was going on with her. And um, so I like this list better um, because it was developed by an actual person with an actual lived experience. Um, lights are a huge thing. Um, people get fatigued easily. Honestly, sometimes it has to do with the light. Um, people I always talk about when you come into my office, it's all standing lamps and I have kind of subdued lighting. I, that's that's for a reason. Um, everything. Uh, one of the things that I, when I was visiting her at one point, um, her ability to regulate her body temperature was really bad. So she would just, it looked like she was fidgeting, but it was really that she was just walking from room to room trying to figure out how to get comfortable temperature wise. Um, so this is a long, exhausted list. So I, I, 100%, it can be all things. Um, that said, when you're working with someone with brain injury, brain injury can, everything can be the brain injury and not all the things are the brain injury, right? That's a way of saying it. So today we're gonna walk through a case study and we're gonna take lots of commercial breaks as I tell the story of Bob Brainy, the barista. Um, and talk about different resources. Um, I know that there is someone on this uh, webinar who actually knows Bob Brainy um, as well as I do. And yeah, that's not really his name. He just happened to have Brainy as his name. Um, but Bob was, so if Marcia, if you wanna pop on at any point and say anything about Bob, feel free. Um, Bob was a bartender in a major, restaurant chain prior to his injury um and not just a bartender he was the person who set up like he would go into a town when they were going to open up one of these big restaurants in a chain and he would set up the bar he would train all the people for the bar he has a lot of customer service experience um he has amazing um like just front front of house customer experience like making people feel welcome ch chats people up right um, he was great at all that, um, but he experienced a brain injury. I met him about two years post brain injury after he'd done all the rehab stuff. So he'd gone to On With Life, um, and I have like to remind people, the people who have brain injuries, they've learned to walk, they've learned to talk, they've learned to use a spoon, they've learned to put on their clothes. Not everyone, I mean, not everyone who has a brain injury has to relearn everything, but at least a good number of the people that I have served um, have been in a situation where they did extensive rehab to regain all these skills. So by the time he comes to me, um, he's done all this rehab, he's accomplished all these things. Um, just congratulations, Bob, for still being alive. Um, and thinks he's ready to go back to work. And at first, when he's ready to go back to work, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm totally ready to go back to work. Let's go gonna run another restaurant thing um and anybody who's ever been around me when we start to have those initial conversations uh will have heard my analogy of we don't prepare to run a marathon by running a marathon and if you did this would be the situation you might find yourself in um when we're we start out slow maybe and I would probably have to run a fourth of a mile and then I'd have to run, I don't run, but I would run some and then I would run a little bit more and a little bit more until I got up and was able to run that full marathon. 
And that's what it's like in doing a thing that we call building work hardness to go back to work. So we want to slowly build so that we're not, if we jump too far ahead, we're going to get into so much frustration that we're for sure going to have problems. So we want to do the training and then we want to do the working, right? So once we kind of done that, the next thing that we did was um, I uh, went and observed Bob at On With Life. He was still doing outpatient treatment. And for those of you who are not in the area, maybe not don't know, On With Life does um, post-acute rehab here in the greater Des Moines area in Ankeny. Um, and he was in outpatient at the time. So I had the opportunity to go meet with him and his occupational therapist. I bring that up because anytime you have the opportunity to work as part of that rehab team with the OT, the speech therapist, the physical therapist, um, if you have the opportunity to work with them and learn from what their skill sets are and learn from what they've learned about the person, this is great. If you can't do that, if you can get those OTPT speech notes from anybody who has been in um, either inpatient or outpatient therapies, uh, you are gonna learn so much from that and you're gonna learn so much about the approach that that person takes with their particular skill set and their particular clinical knowledge. Uh, hugely helpful. So I got the opportunity to go to the OT appointment. Um, the OT uh, assignment that day uh, was to work on putting together a desk, uh, like an Ikea kind of desk, one of those desks that you put together. Um, do miss being in, in front of people because then I could say how many people have been frustrated by trying to put together one of these pieces of furniture and all of you would say yes because it is frustrating. Um, Bob started to put together the, the furniture. They broke the pieces apart. Um, you know, they broke the, the sections of the instructions apart and then they just provided the, what he needed for each set, which is we don't kind of know that when you're working with somebody in this situation. Um, Bob got frustrated when he was trying to put the pins into, you know how like the little penny things fit inside and then you put that together and that makes the desk. And he got frustrated and he slammed this thing. Um, magically, because for, I don't know, the Ikea furniture gods were on his side and all the pegs fit into the little holes, but I was looking at it and it's amazing that they did not break. Um, this gives us important information before we even go into looking at employment. I know that when Bob gets frustrated or when something doesn't happen easily, that Bob has a tendency to force things. Um, this happened just the other day. Bob was had bought a new ring. He was trying to put the ring on. Um, it wasn't going on and he shoved it really hard onto his hand and ended up in the emergency room and they ended up having to cut it off. Um, so one of the things that we're working on constantly is how can we stop ourselves before we get into the situation where we're slamming things? We'll get to that again in a little bit and talk about how we're addressing that. The next thing that we did was we went into uh, do transportation training. And in transportation training, um, we um, worked with, Catlin, if you guys are in the area, you know about Catlin, um, have maybe met him. Um, we worked with Catlin to do a transportation training. Now, instead of just, I did do individual transportation training with Bob, but the other thing that I did was I organized this event for Bob to come to where we could do transportation in a group setting. That was intentional. Um, when I'm doing prep work with somebody, I'm gonna give you a bunch of different ideas about how to do this in your communities. But when I'm doing like all that kind of like pre, pre get the job work, a lot of times I'm gonna be trying to see if I can find a group situation for them to do that, or even a non-disability, like something that's open to the general public and this person can do it in a general public setting or with other people. Um, that's because I'm not just, I, anytime I'm working with Bob or anybody else, I'm not just trying to work on that skill that we're building. I'm also working on frustration tolerance, on appropriate social interactions, um, on um, all of these things. And they're easier 
it's easier to be able to keep working on that in a group setting than it is if you're always one on one with that person in that prep work stage. Then when you're in with other people at the job site, it's not going to be as easy. So as much as possible, trying to find those group areas. Another way, if you're doing employment work, that you can put people in a group setting, and I know group setting in this post pandemic age is a terrible word. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, but I used to, I actually used to be employed by the Iowa workforce. Um, and that's where I got to learn about all the great things that they offer as far as resume building classes, uh, soft skill classes. Um, they have classes on um, interviewing. Um, they have all these workshops that you can do. And that is a great way, if you're gonna work on a resume, maybe instead of working with the person individually or in a disability related setting, maybe being able to work in those Iowa Works workshops so that you're doing it in a general pop setting, general population setting. Um, and right now, a lot of those are on Zoom. Like I think they have Zoom meetings or maybe, I don't know how they do it, um, but they're remote. And, and, you know, that's okay. I mean, it's terrible, but it's also okay in the sense that our world is a lot of these kinds of situations that we're in right now and not face-to-face. -face. And so this might be a skill that this person needs to learn. And in addition to getting a resume, they also need to be able to function in one of these virtual settings that we all live in now. Um, so that could provide you an opportunity to do that. And so I will make sure that these, um, these PowerPoints get out. Um, and then you'll have this link and you can look and see in your area. I will say it's not the world's easiest website to navigate. So if you struggle with it, you might want to just call your local Iowa Works office and figure out how to, what they have to offer. Okay. Commercial interruption about the COVID. Just going to say, in case you haven't noted, COVID sucks. I'm going to say that specifically COVID sucks for people with brain injury. And that is because... If, the, if we were gonna cut this entire four part series down to like, I don't know, two minutes, I would tell you that the best things that you can do for your any brain, not just brain and your brains, all the brains, um, is exercise and human connection. These are the two things that are best for neuro health. Anything that is good for your heart is good for your brain. That includes exercise, particularly for some reason, HIIT training. That's a whole different presentation. I happen to be into yoga. We'll talk about that in a different session. Um, and human interaction. That thing that we do where we're all, where we're together and we're talking, um, it is not only good for the heart because of all the lovey feelings that we have towards our other fellow humans most of the time, um, but also because it's a very complex cognitive task to think about what you're going to say, listen to what the other person's saying, hold on to what you're going to say, say it, process it. Um, that is a very complex and it's really a strong neurobehavioral thing. So I'm just going to say like, these things are cool if you can figure out a way to work them into your post-pandemic life um, and the post-pandemic life of the people that you serve. Fabulous. All right, so we've done all this pre-stuff. We're getting ready to start applying for jobs and we're putting together resumes, a resume. And I'm gonna say this about this. This is a particular statement that we used in Bob's resume um, to address both the employment gap and also to give the employer a little heads up that something had happened. Um, whether or not you're going out and doing like job development where you're actually going out to talk to the employers about people or whether or not you're doing it in applications and resumes, what I have found most effective, I'm gonna say there's a, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can approach this, um, but what I have found most effective is to not necessarily refer to it as a brain injury in those early stages. Um, brain injury, disability, accommodations, those are all great words, and I 100% believe in all the job development ways to do that. For brain injury, I have found it particularly helpful to say there was a major accident. The person has been, I don't even like the word recovery for brain injury. I, that's a whole different subject. But in this sense, I really do like it and I use it. And I say, 
the person had a major accident, they, uh, and I, you know, if they're open to that, there's all the disclosure stuff. This he wrote, we put in his resume, so it was 100% comfortable with it, but that there was an accident, it changed everything in his life. He's on the road to recovery and he has a new sense of purpose and he's looking for a position that's gonna provide an opportunity for him to grow in his recovery. The reason I think that this works is because employers don't see it as a damaged person who needs help, but they see it as a person who is on this miraculous journey of recovery and you are giving them a the option of being part of that process. And people like that. They like being part of the story. In Bob's case, he got the job right away. It happened like literally we sent the information to the hiring manager and I hadn't driven probably not a mile um, when they'd already called him and said that he got the job. Um, I don't know if that's a that's a new world order thing, whatever. It happened really fast and much faster than we expected. So we hadn't really prepped um, for that, but it happened super fast. And they, you could tell from the way they responded to his resume that they wanted to hire him right away. Um, so now we're going in and we've got to think about a little bit more about disclosure and how we're going to address this situation. So what Bob did or what Bob and I did together is going to go back to the Fabulous Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa has this brain injury handbook and resource guide on their website. I have a bunch of them printed out and they're in my office. Um, they're pretty thick packets and um, they are a wealth of information about employing somebody with a brain injury. Um, I took one of those packets. I wrote a letter that on my letterhead that said, hey, you know, congratulations on hiring Bob. He's going to be amazing. I expect everything to go really well. Um, here's some information on brain injury. If you're interested, the, you know, these are some things that you might see. And um, here's some information about me if you want to contact me directly. Um, I gave that, I did not talk directly to the employer. I did not disclose this information. I per, gave that packet with the letter, which Bob knew what it said to Bob. And then at the point of that, we all know where you do disclosure. So you disclose after you've fully gotten the job, but before that job starts. In that place, Bob was able to hand this to the employer himself and have a conversation about, hey, here's a guide. If you see anything that you feel like I need help with, these are some ways that you can help me. And here's a person that you can contact if you need even additional assistance um, that, that can help me be the best employee that I can be here, right? Um, I like this approach because it, it empowers the person to be the person. They're doing all the disclosing. They're doing all the talking. They're doing the advocating. And by providing this information to the employer, you're putting yourself in a situation where you're automatically building those natural supports that are going to be utilized by the employer um, and building it up. So you've got full-fledged moving for success all the way forward. Um, in that guide, you will see that there's um, there's accommodations for different things. So it'll say like difficulty remembering things. Uh, it will might say something about aggression. There's all different kinds of like symptomologies of brain injury, and then it'll give you the signs. So like difficulty remembering. What's a sign that they're having difficulty remembering? They're unable to remember tasks from day to day. They're unable to remember new information. And here's what to do. Because they had that information and could kind of look through it, right? Um, they immediately had, so the place that he got employed um, is an upscale hotel that has a coffee bar. Um, and they were able to come up with having, there's one other barista that works there. Um, it's a good job choice just because it's similar to the job that he did before. Um, in the sense that it's drinks. Um, and also it's a kind of slow moving environment. It's more upscale. It's not meant to be super fast paced. It's meant to be an experiential kind of thing. Um, the other barista created a book complete with um, like slide in paper and checklists and a white marker um, so that Bob could learn all the various tasks that were involved with this job. 
for more resources for accommodations, obviously you can always contact um, the JAN network. Um, let me see if I can find this other thing. Okay. I am not doing this. This is not working. Okay, that's fine. I'm not gonna try to do that. Um, you can always contact the JAN network, but there's also a site at the Brain Injury Alliance. Again, I'm bringing them up. Um, the Brain Injury Alliance has this thing called the accommodation tip sheets. And you can see right here where the tip sheet is. Um, okay, let me see if I can. Okay, I do have to kind of bounce out of this for a second. Okay. Da, 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 da. Because I do really want to take you guys to this. I'm just having trouble finding it on here. Google, here we go. Okay, can you guys see this now? Nobody's speaking to me. But um, this is the accommodation tip sheet for the brain injury that the Brain Injury Alliance offers. What's super cool about these is that you can look at something like emotional dysregulation, and you've got a full tip sheet that's going to say what it is what to look for that's going to show you that it's happening and all the accommodations that you can use in order to help that person. Um, there's so many of them and they really like make it easily digestible. Um, so whether or not you're utilizing that with the person served or whether or not you're utilizing that with the employer, I just think it's a great way to be able to find really digestible information um, that's going to help that person know what those accommodations are. Um, and you know, these are great examples of mindfulness, things that you can do in the minute. Super, super helpful. Um, within the first day that Bob had, or first two days that Bob um, uh, that Bob was working in this environment, he um, made an inappropriate comment to someone. Uh, that's gonna happen. If you work in brain injury, people are gonna say inappropriate things. Um, if you find yourself in that situation, um, correct without blaming. So the idea is uh, you're gonna say, that's inappropriate, this is the kind of thing. And it's a pretty good idea to make a list. Um, this is the list that we have with Bob about uh, what we're not gonna talk about. Um, I will say be consistent, be universal and be all the time, particularly in the air, uh, area of foul language. Um, I have multiple times, so many times, uh, had to say to somebody, we're just gonna have to not use foul language at all, not on the basketball court, not with your brothers, not anywhere for a while while we're trying to interview for a job. Um, and the reason that we have to do that is because when you have a brain injury, there's a different, you don't know how to make your, it, not everybody, but it's very common that somebody doesn't understand how to have behavior in one scenario and not have it in another. And when you think about it, the fact that any of us can do that is amazing. Like this is one of those areas where brain injury is fascinating because when you see it go wrong, you're amazed that it ever goes right. Um, people sometimes with brain injury are gonna have a hard time with generalization and discrimination. Generalization is the idea that I can look at two similar, similar situations and be able to tell that even though those things are slightly different, they actually are gonna, I'm gonna interact with them the same way. So you see the cat, you see the two fish, right? Discrimination is even though these things look alike, I'm gonna interact with them in very different ways. So if you think about, um, a church service and a rock concert are very similar if you were just to look, right? Um, but if you were to, you act very differently in a church service than you do in a rock concert because there's different expectations for behavior. You have to be able to know when to use generalization and when to use discrimination. Because that can be a problem, it's an executive function problem that can create issues. 
to avoid people dropping F-bombs in their interview, and I mean that really literally, we will just stop using that word altogether and we'll work with those natural supports. Telling someone not to cuss in an interview, but not telling them to try to universalize that experience while they're preparing for the interview, my experience just doesn't work. Um, okay, we have about 10 minutes. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the chocolate syrup incident of 2021 um, and kind of approaching that. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna have to pause uh, for the next session. And I, I get to do something I've never done, cliffhanger. Um, if you guys return in the next couple of weeks, we can talk about um, escape rooms and some other kind of interesting things. So the chocolate incident, chocolate syrup incident of 2021 um, was when Bob was pouring the syrup into the chocolate syrup into the coffee mug. Um, the, the little cap, cap, the whole cap that the spout would be on popped off and chocolate syrup spilled all over the floor. Things were going pretty well with the job until then. Um, but when the chocolate syrup spilled, um, a couple of things happen to Bob when he gets really frustrated. One, he stops being able to use, it's not that he can't find language, it's like he, literally it's the motor skill portion of his brain that is that starts to struggle and he can't really talk. Um, and he started to shake, he was visibly upset, he was a little bit cursing, um, then he stood up and kind of said, and well, okay, he said, in front of the whole room, including somebody who was there from corporate, don't worry, I'm not gonna kill anybody. Um, this was enough for them to say, we, may, we might wanna concentrate on that job coaching a little bit. That's one of the unfortunate things about job coaching people with brain injuries is that um, it's not that they're gonna have consistent behavior that's problematic. It's that one thing can create a level of frustration that causes problematic behavior, right? So when we go in to do this extra job coaching, um, we there's these pinwheels that are on that that are one of the things that are served and someone comes up and orders a pinwheel and bob comes in over the top of the pinwheel with the um, tongs and the pinwheel's too big for the tongs, so he just keeps jabbing at it instead of coming under it um and so then bob and i started having these conversations about and so we started talking about how that's the person it all worked out the the person who was getting the pinwheel helped Bob kind of work these things out, um, work it out. And the guy got his pinwheel and all was good with the world. Um, but then we started having conversations about how if we don't stop, step back and change our strategy, that can lead to increased frustration. So Bob and I refer to this as a pinwheel, the chocolate syrup situation. Um, we want to tackle those pinwheel situations so that we have the skill set to deal with the chocolate syrup situations, right? Um, particularly with both of these, but particularly the pinwheel thing, this has to do with the shift in cognitive strategies. So if you look at this picture, you can tell that this person is standing way too close to this wall to be able to see that you can walk around it. So when this person is looking at the wall, all they can see is that they need to get over the wall, right? Or in Bob's case, he probably would slam his body through the wall. But if we step away from the wall and we take a breath and we slow down, breathe for a minute, then we'll realize that we don't have to jump over the wall. We don't have to slam our body through the wall. We could actually just walk around the wall. And so that, that's kind of where we are, is trying to say, how do we breathe? How do we take a minute? And what are some strategies that we can put into place to help with that shift in cognitive strategies? Here is a whole list of the things that we are working on to shift those cognitive strategies. So this is a cliffhanger, I think, because we have about six minutes. I can carry on unless somebody has a question. I mean, I can carry on for the next four minutes unless somebody has a very specific, um, a very specific question up to date. All right. 
So really quick, I'm going to give you like a little bit of it. So we've talked about appropriate conversations. I'm going to refer back to a lot of these in the coming in the coming classes. But here's one thing that you can do to address cog um, cognitive sh strategy shifting. Um, it's an online game that um, Bob is doing every day where he can go through. And if you go to this website, you'll be able to be able to figure out how this game works. Um, it's an online game and it's basically about changing strategies. Um, the first, it's, I'm not going to get too much into it, um, but if you go there, you can find it. I don't even, this is, it's very, very similar to a thing called the Wisconsin card sorting test, um, which is a neuropsych assessment that is done. Um, I don't even so much care if it actually rebuilds neuro, neuroplasticity doing this exercise. The point is by doing this exercise on a regular basis, Bob is reminding himself that he has to switch strategies on a regular basis, right? And that I think is very important. Um, the other thing that we're doing as far as soft skill building is making sure that the person recognizes kind of what kind of soft skills they're working on. Um, we developed this, we have an online tool to send out on online forms and things. Um, and so we were able to develop this very specific soft skills assessment tool that we send both to the person served and to the employer to rank excellent to needs urgent intervention. Um, we can send that on reg out on regular intervals to the employer and the person served. We get that information back. It's a way to stay very connected, especially in that longer term sense when you're preparing for natural supports to be taking over. Um, it's an opportunity for us to not only see where the person is on these different soft skill areas, but also to see whether or not they're they and their employer see those soft skills the same. So it's a way to sort of measure insight and also the general soft skills. I promised myself I was going to get you guys out of here at 4.30 today. So we're going to stop and I'm going to promise you, promise you that we're going to deal with a lot of the other stuff that was on that list in the next session. Um, I'm going to share again so I can remind you guys. Okay. Uh, let's go back. Okay, we are getting back together. Hold on. I am gonna get better at this. All right, uh, let me go back. I am sharing my screen. You are, you are screen sharing. Um, we are coming back together on February 3rd. Um, Lots of fun stuff to still talk about. Um, uh, I the sh it's called set game. The game it's called set game. If you just Google set game, um, you can find it. Um, and this we are going to make sure that this presentation comes out. And there's a link in the presentation portion. Are there any other questions before we close up? Please come back. I was so great to see all you guys logging on again after last week. Thank you for participating and for joining us in this journey to learn as much as we can about living with people with brain injury. <laughs>